Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. I am super excited that you are all here and that this is happening. This, of course, is both part of a larger project and the result of the work of many people and organizations. And I'll say a little bit about that. But first, I wanted to give the word to the directors of two amazing spaces here at Yale, without whom the symposium would not have happened. And um, maybe we'll start with um, the director of the European Studies Council. Do you want to take over, Dita? Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Professor uh, El Taib, for inviting me to open this um, wonderful event. Um, I am Edita Boyanowska, the chair of the European Studies Council, the co-organizer uh, for this symposium, and I'm also here as a scholar who's interested in um, bringing the problem of race into the study of Russian culture, so I'm here also as an interested um, audience member. Um, the symposium is part of the Intersectional Black European Studies Project in BEST, I love the acronym, um, funded by the Senate of Berlin, Germany, and is in close collaboration with the Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Gender Studies at the Technical University of Berlin, Yale's Center for Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration, and with us at the European Studies Council. Um, as an institution that fosters interdisciplinary um, uh, collaborations um, about uh, across Yale and internationally, the European Studies uh, Council is very proud to sponsor this mm -hmm. event, um, this project, and the study of race in Europe more broadly that Professor uh, El Taib has been championing so successfully, um, is key to our council's vision of what it means to study Europe in the 21st century. Um, we are committed to supporting cutting edge innovative research that combines the re-examination of European historical and cultural legacies, but also uh, a study of contemporary problems within European societies, such as racism, uh, migration, populism, democratic backsliding, um, and we are especially delighted when we are able to build um, collaborations with European institutional partners and with uh, academic communities uh, in Europe who obviously have so much to contribute to this conversation. So I'm very pleased to welcome all the participants um, and thank the council staff for their amazing work in putting this symposium together. Uh, and to congratulate Fatima and her INVEST co-conveners for organizing an incredibly important collaborative symposium. I wish you all two days of um, thinking, productive two days of thinking about how to archive marginalized knowledges and warm welcome to all. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Steve Pitty. I'm the director of Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. I do want to welcome everybody, and I want to say thank you to everybody who put this on. You know, in, in talking with Fatima a few weeks ago, um, I suggested that I wanted to make a welcome statement, but it was really a ploy to say thank you to Fatima in front of everybody. As everybody, I think, knows, this took um, an incredible amount of effort, vision, hard work, persistence. Um, over uh, a great deal of time to put together this event and, of course, the larger project of which this is just part. Um, Fatima has been an just a stellar colleague um, since her arrival a couple of years ago, has changed the culture of this place, and what we're seeing today is just one of many, many examples of the ways in which she's transformed this institution uh, and is transforming so many fields that you'll see represented here today. So again, big thank you, Fatima. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is a, a good transition to um, my thank yous. The first um, is an official one. As Edita already said, um, the Intersectional Black European Studies Project is 
on the one hand, an outcome of decades of black feminist organizing, and you'll hear more about that on the first panel, but it's also a result of the United Nations decade dedicated to people of African descent, which ends next year. I don't know um, how many of you know that it even happened. Um, Germany, among other nations, committed to supporting the goals of, of this decade, but as far as I know, um, the state of Berlin was the only one who actually put money behind their words. So um, we thank the former Berlin Senate for their financial support <laughs> of Invest. The current Berlin Senate cut off funding, so um, no thanks to them. That doesn't mean, definitely doesn't mean the end of the project, but it does mean that we are looking for other funding sources. So if you have connections or money, please hit us up. Um, now I wanna, um, thank um, people who have made this um, symposium possible, um, starting with Christina Tavia, with, with whom many of you have already interacted from the Yale Event Center, um, Asia Nöpane and Carly Kerbel from um, the European Studies Council, um, Victoria Stone Cadenia from the um, Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration, and Alina Gote from the Technical University in Berlin. I also want to thank my colleague Lisa Lowe, who can't be here today, but also generously supported our symposium. And I want to give an extra special thanks to our two amazing research assistants, uh, Wasima Labish, who unfortunately can't be here today, but is absolutely essential to our project, and Tim Link, who is here today. Thank you very much. And I also want to give a shout out to the Yale Black Feminist Collective for promoting our event. And of course, as always, to um, the program of ethnicity, race, and migration for their support and the program and my other a program the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program here. Um, okay, now I have a few housekeeping things. A lot had to do with um, all the food being served in the courtyard. You can forget about that for today, I think. Um, we have um, for lunch room 109. So if the weather stays, stays like that, we'll direct you there. Um, if the weather gets better and we can go outside, there's um, a door to the courtyard to your left. That is a shorter way. That way is also the restrooms if you need them. Um, what else? Right, the event is being filmed by our videographer, Bronwyn Pagelthorpe. So if you do not want to be filmed, photographed, um, then you can put a red dot on your name tag. And we'll um, honor that, of course. So um, our first panel is um, with um, the INVEST co-convener. So we'll tell you a little bit about the larger context of the project, how each of us came to that and what our particular part um, in that is. But we also have seven graduate fellows who are part of this project. And they will, three of them, um, Face Macharia, Sam Jost, and Jorge Banuelos will talk more about their work um, on the first panel after lunch. We also have um, an exhibit that was created um, by FACE, by Isaac Jean-Francois, Ali Tulila, and Elisa Cabrey. So during the breaks, please um, go in there and explore and interact. 
Um, this is the first open day of the symposium. Tomorrow we have closed workshops with a number of scholars and practitioners of Black Europe. So if you're not um, part of the Saturday event, please leave your thoughts, questions, ideas in the room next doors. Um, there's an easel with paper for you to leave comments and we'll take that into tomorrow. Um, we also have um, a documentation group consisting of some of our fellows. Um, and I would ask them to just briefly stand up if you don't mind, because what they will do is walk around and maybe ask you questions. So don't think they're weirdos, they're all part <laughs> of, the, of the project. Okay, um, and finally for this the semester, we'll have the support of two amazing undergrad scholars, Chenise Ngori and Dumi Kyoko. So I wanna thank them very much as well. Yeah, and I think um, that was my intro. Apologies if I got, forgot anything or anyone. Um, what I'll do now is transition to our first panel with the invest convener. So if you all want to come up here. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Is there a clock in this room so we can do some timekeeping? Or am I going to have as a union clock? <laughs> yeah, that, that's why the guy carried around his clock. Richard Clark. <laughs> um, the idea is about five minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of contemplating going back and forth if I should get my smartphone or not, but. Um, um, it's going to be okay. So um, good morning again. Um, it's a joyful moment to be able to be here um, at this point in the Intersectional Black European Studies Project. And um, I'm starting our panel off. I'm going to say, touch on three things very shortly. And I'd also like to start by thanking you, Fatima. And um, it's an important moment for our project um, we we have been trying to um, create um, a, a public spaces uh, for a discussion around intersectional Black European studies for quite a while. Fatima and Peggy had already initiated the BEST, the Black European Studies Project, and then there was um, a lack of institutional support for uh, almost two decades, mm -hmm. and now within the, the formal frame of the um, UN decade for people of African heritage, people of African descent, we have been able to um, uh, work with partners in the state of Berlin uh, to come to this point. So um, we don't take it for granted. And uh, we also don't take your support, Fatima, for granted that you're able to share your resources with us from uh, a space uh, in the North American space, the space in the US, which although you have many um, tribulations as well <laughs> in, in, in this context, um, we look to this space as a space that's innovative around how you um, deal with issues of, of uh, studies of race, uh, uh, but also of scholarship of uh, BIPOC, of racially, racially marginalized scholars, and how it's been possible to incubate a certain amount of thought on uh, intersectionality and on Black studies, on African studies, on the studies of the lives of um, Black, Afro-diasporic, and African people. So it's an inspiration to us and uh, that you that you shared your resources and given us a larger uh, public is um, something we don't take for granted. That's deeply appreciated. So the other two things I want to say is I want to give us an idea of where, of where we are in this project. So we had BEST uh, in the beginning of the 2000 years and uh, with two conferences in 2005, 2008. And then um, uh, the North American space went on to create uh, uh, chairs around uh, Black Europe 
around Black European studies across the disciplines. And uh, the place where those chairs did not materialize is Little Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's our situation. And uh, we've just been speaking back and forth uh, among uh, those of us who are situated in, in the, uh, uh, um, uh, the context of Black Europe. And uh, we've spoken about the barriers against creating, uh, uh, against institutionalization, against creating a formal space uh, within academic institutions, within the academy for research on Black Europe, on Black lives. And uh, um, that, that this, is, this is the point that I want to stress, that this lack of recognition and the struggle against this lack of recognition has happened a lot around uh, Black queer feminist organizing. And uh, um, we have created shadow studies, um, which uh, um, have been have been done with a lot of risk and has been done beside the other work we've been doing. And it's reflected also in how we sit here. Um, so when I pass on to the other conveners, they're also going to say what their association is and how they have tried to, um, I'm not going to say siphon the resources of those institutions, but to kind of also use those, those resources to further this work of creating studies on Black Europe and on Black lives in Europe. So that's my second point, that it's been a struggle for recognition, the struggle is ongoing, and um, what has been important is to be able to find solidarity and to find alternative spaces, which we have found within the context of um, gender studies, of intersectional, intersectional gender studies. I'm going to call it a very um, fraught relationship, but an important one. Mm -hmm. So it's not always also been easy to create those spaces uh, um, in, in those institutions. But we began, uh, I promised I was going to say something very shortly about the new process. So last year we began in summer, by writing the grant, then we had uh, an opening conference, which we called the a future, a, a look into the future uh, in Berlin. And this was um, mostly organized by the Center for Interdisciplinary Women and Gender Studies at the Technical University in Berlin. And uh, when we organized this, we had uh, at the beginning panels where we, we tried to learn from the, the story of institutionalization of gender studies, which is uh, a, a history which is not, um, it's not, it's not uh, uh, completed. And uh, it has certain um, conjunctures, but also moments of failure. So we're trying to learn from those moments, from the moments of success, but also the moments of failure. And if you think uh, a little bit towards uh, how long this, this history has been, it began somewhere around the 90s with the formalization of the, of the gender studies centers. There's some that are slightly older, but I'm speaking about the Berliner, um, those who are, who are in Berlin. So we are trying to learn from that. And we are trying to also um, um, think realistically. They, we speak from institutions being like big, huge ships, like tankers, which take quite a while to shift into one direction. So we are trying to learn from what it, it takes to shift an institution in, in a direction that in which we think it's productive, and then what we do when the institution shifts in a direction that we don't think is productive. That was my second point. And my last point is to um, localize this project in Black Berlin, in the Berlin in which, in the moment in which we are in Berlin, we had a very opportune moment in which we had uh, a red, red, green coalition, which is the midwife for the project that, that we're living in. And then as slightly, uh, what would you call it, melancholic, tragic Berlin <laughs> situation occurred, that uh, we had Berlin elections in 2021 um, directly on the same day as the marathon. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of lo logistical stuff uh, went wrong. So we had a repeat of the elections. And the repeat of the elections, as we know, in our democratic processes and, and in, in how uh, popular, um, popular, um, uh, race popular populism has, has led to weakening institutions, uh, had a very low turnout. And we know what a low turnout means. That critical thought, that uh, um, the, the, the critique of dominance, the critique of, of um, um, inequalities uh, weakens with, with uh, uh, less electoral support. So we are in a situation where we do not have a conjuncture, where uh, right now we are, we are kind of swimming against the flow. Um, but Black queer feminist organizing is mostly also swimming against the flow. So uh, we are undaunted in the face of this task. We do not take uh, um, moments of, of um, uh, intense conjuncture for, for granted, but the moment in which we are in, we also work in that moment. That's where we are now. And Fatima, you also said it in the beginning, uh, we are looking for alternative funding um, and we have some, um, some, some good options at the moment. Um, so uh, um, 
people who work with a lot of security would say, what are options? For us who work with little security, options are always moments of potential. So we're, we're, looking, we're looking towards that. And uh, just to end it, the, 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 uh, one of the projects in Berlin right now is uh, that, that, that uh, gives us um, a, a place to, to also argue further is um, the, the, the project in Berlin called Decolonize Berlin which uh, also looks towards um, um, the diversity of body politics in, in knowledge production, the diversity of, of, of geopolitics in body production, we, uh, in, in knowledge production. We can talk along in these two days a little bit more about that. When I speak in the workshop, uh, feminist Africans and queer African studies, we're also going to touch a little bit on that. So there's hope, um, but there's little security. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a weird place. To, <laughs> it, it's a weird place to inhabit. I guess, but it's also institutional life and, and institutional suffering. I guess um, it's 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 a part of our reality. And I am going to pass on to uh, my colleague, uh, Denise Bebold Caldwell. Um, I'm not going to say what you're going to say because you will say it yourself. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Maisha, and thank all of you to that we are sitting here because um, like I just said it the last time, I'm not the, I mean, you were like former for me and I'm like somebody who is following or you made something possible for me. So yeah, I want to thank you all for that. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, publishing because um, we all decided to um yeah to publish in um uh, in a series about intersectional black european studies and um i want to talk about the difficulties to publish about um these kind of topics because you as you all know we don't have like black studies or afro studies or something like that or in in within europe and especially not in um, germany or in austria where i work so it's like we don't we don't really have that on the one side and it's like we always had that marginalized knowledge like you said maisha yeah, but the marginalized knowledge like um there is the exhibition you can see all these um things that were like written on papers or on some uh, on something and but it's not really like um institutionalized and so we try to i guess it's some kind of institutionalization if we try to publish that knowledge and so that's where we want to start but on the other hand in europe right now it's like happening some kind of outsell of black studies and so everybody's doing black studies and you are like okay but well is this still a critical approach or is this uh, some kind of outsell from a new topic what is what what is really fancy and all that stuff so we are on the on the other hand uh try to um yeah root a real critic uh, perspective on intersectional black European studies so that's where we are now and it takes some time to like concept and try to go in all these archives and look in the, into them and not just saying okay now we have a new black European studies no we don't because there were some former people who are to, who did, who were pointing out their knowledge and who who brought their knowledge into the world and but we like trying to yeah publish some some things of that so okay i want to pass on because i'm to catch up hello everybody very glad to be here a little nervous <laughs> um I prepared some questions. I cannot just talk freely about anything. Um, the questions are why am I, I am a part of INVEST and uh, of the INVEST Collective. I like that term Fatima said or gave us a name, INVEST Collective. And uh, three things came to my mind. The first thing is uh, the activism. The second one, that racism is a traumatic experience and does something with our body. And the third one for my civic organization, Okay, I start. 
As activists, we have been working for decades to make our experiences accessible and more so visible. To have Black studies is a way of acknowledgement and recognition, and also to diversify knowledge itself and knowledge producing institutions. Universities are powerful institutions. The opportunity to study Black studies brings on a concrete level a form of recognition that our experiences, our approaches, approaches to knowledge are sources of knowledge and our responses, no, wait a minute, <laughs> bring on a concrete level, a form of recognition that our experiences, our approaches to knowledge are sources of knowledge and our responses to social change matter. Mm -hmm. So in my vision, we interrupt also the normalization of white scholarship on race and blackness in Europe. Racism, that my second thought, racism is historical reference, racism and its historical references are traumatic. The experience of racism is a trauma informed and a collective experience, above all an embodied experience. So an experience, that sits in our bodies. The genesis of racism is inconceivable without the process of racialization and negatively assigning our bodies. Then in my understanding, our bodies are central to form solutions, but at the same time, due to the power dynamics, we shut down our body's experiences. Every day, we disconnect from our body on the way, on our way to work, while shopping, while studying, and all these activities of daily life. That is the reason we formed within the project Intersectional Black European Study, a model of reflection. We address questions of what would it be like for us to have our bodies lovingly addressed, especially in higher learning settings. Body work is a form of healing, mm -hmm. a reappropriation, a loving attention, it's a form of empowerment to have agency over our bodies again. My third thought, to work in an organization like the ARR Berlin, a civic organization, our mission is, our mission is education and equity, especially for children and youth who experience racism. We are also a very diverse organization and many of the workers experience educational injustice themselves. We create projects and tools to address forms of structural injustice. From my perspective as a practitioner, we are in need of social workers and other personnel which have a foundational understanding of how power dynamics work. Um, people who have in-depth knowledge of how racism, also anti-Black racism works and affects us. And mm. the third point, people who bring activist knowledge also to the table. Civic organizations like the RR Berlin need the connection between universities and community knowledge. I deliberately named Punkt. Sorry, <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> so my last point. Uh, I deliberately named body work second because it frames both points I just mentioned. Knowledge building, knowledge expansion, whether in universities or activist spaces, both need body work to nurture, to understand that knowledge is nothing abstract, but informed by our bodies. It is also important to not turn our internalized norms against us. We need collective spaces where our bodies speak to heal. Lastly, it is important to emphasize that in a black queer feminist understanding, university knowledge does not serve an end in itself, but in connection with communities structural change becomes possible. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, I'm also very happy to be here. And um, I think uh, maybe now I can calm down a little bit because I was also nervous. Um, I want to thank you too, Fatima. Um, it feels like um, things come, you know, come again together, um, and uh, um, from you know the 
various uh, paths we have to go and we go when within uh, this journey of um, uh, bringing together our bodies, our knowledge, our um, memories, and also our emotions. And um, my colleagues and friends already talked about uh, a lot of the steps we took and where we were. Um, I also concentrated in uh, preparation for that to think about um, so what, uh, how I came to um, um, intersection of Black European studies, uh, how my way was, and um, yeah, how I am part of that. And I came up with three, um, yeah, timely positions or steps. Um, so the short answer to uh, how I came to intersection of Black European studies would be through ADEFRA, um, the uh, Black Queer Feminist uh, Collective, um, which I uh, uh, could join um, after the wall came down um, and uh, I could uh, travel uh, from East Germany. Um, and what I experienced there was um, a lively um, uh, uh, con co connecting of, uh, of people, connecting of um, collective experiences, um, and uh, creating a space where um, Black women, Black uh, uh, lesbians could uh, grow up together. Um, and um, I could see that um, that was uh, um, already an, um, a, a, a practicing of um, also archiving knowledge. And I could immediately feel what an impact that had, because it had an impact on me, on me personally. Um, so um, bringing uh, Black sister sisters together, also transnationally, I already learned about, you know, your connections, Katya, you are a founding member of um, ADEFRA and um, uh, you connecting in the 80s already, you know, also with the sisters in, um, in the Netherlands, uh, Gloria Becker is here as well. So that is all what I, in, when I came to this collective, um, already learned as, as an archive. And, um, but I could not go anywhere you know, to read that up or um, being taught in, in classes. Um, so that was uh, uh, very much important. Also the, um, yeah, the work, what you all already put into uh, the Afrikaters, um, we see that also in the exhibition a little bit. Um, so that was very, very important. Um, it impressed me, but it showed me also um, that is uh, a com how community work is um, uh, uh, yeah, changing our lives. Um, so in becoming a part of this movement, that was my first step to um, also intersectional Black studies, I would say. In the 1990s, um, we organized very often um, events where we shared uh, papers we, which we pr presented at, at the universities where we you know, were just going through our education because that's where we usually were the only uh, Black person and our experience uh, was not relevant to the curriculum or to most of the people in the course. So um, that was for me also a, a learning process in this time um, where we uh, um, shared this uh, from our various disciplines. Um, I learned th there something about black musicians or uh, black history um, uh, in Germany. Um, and uh, I shared something um, on uh, colonial images in advertisement and racism in East Germany. So um, these exchanges uh, brought me also, you know, to the uh, uh, thought um, it would be really important um, to uh, collect and um, archive these uh, um, uh, materials. Um, so um, we came up with the idea, you know, to start uh, something to collect our thesis that was way before the World Wide Net. Mm -hmm. So you could not just go and click somewhere, mm -hmm. but you ha really had to know somebody, you know, that, um, okay, we studied uh, um, or somebody did a thesis at a university there and there to a topic which was uh, interesting. So that was also an, um, an important mile milestone to that. Um, and finally, also, you know, when we then um, started as uh, uh, young people trying to connect, you know, to diasporic uh, discourses, also academic discourses, 
um, how you do that when we when you have no institutions in Germany or in general Europe, uh, you come to the US, you know. So we started to go to conferences and um, finally, um, when um, in San Diego there was a GSA, um, there was an idea born uh, with uh, Fatima and um, uh, Sarah Lennox and myself um, about you know bring, trying to create a network to bring the people together who are doing basically the same like us, you know, finding connections with other uh, uh, um, black knowledge pro uh, producers. That was when the idea of uh, Black uh, European Studies was born, and um, we had a good a good ride. Um, but as actually Maisha, when you just were you know explaining um, a little bit the situation right now, I thought, yeah, we are always going through this wave, as you know. So when the funding ended, um, um, we had no uh, possibilities to institutionalize um, uh, Black European Studies. But um, uh, uh, the work continued and um, continued in different ways. And um, um, I was also uh, glad to uh, uh, bring some of these ideas also um, in um, the positions I'm, I'm working in now to um, the uh, uh, um, Federal Agency for Civic Education. Um, when uh, um, the goal is to facilitate spaces and resources for citizens uh, to further their political consciousness, um, to discuss and negotiate their visions of how they want to live together and what kind of society they want to uh, live in. So that applies to everybody. Um, so it means also to black people uh, in Germany. Um, and um, it also means that uh, uh, you need to know about your own um, experience your own uh, life and uh, um, your uh, community. Um, so the intersectional Black European Studies um, is for me a platform that uh, makes uh, these necessary uh, connections and also this knowledge available um, for Black people to be able to be to negotiate exactly these ideas if of uh, if of how we want to live together. And thank you. Yeah, please turn the, the, the timer on again. So that I'll just stop talking after five minutes. I want to start with um, two things I forgot to mention before. I think Roy Soler was the only fellow I didn't mention by name. Apologies. So, Roy. <laughs> And also, if you if you didn't grab a program, you might not know that there is a QR code that will allow you to add music to our playlist. That will be the soundtrack for our reception. So if you haven't done so yet, please do it. Okay, and in the back, there's also a QR code. Um, I first uh, want to thank you all because you brought me into into this project, even though I'm here, and that's not entirely coincidental because I know most of the people here more than thirty years, some closer to forty years. Um, <laughs> um, at a certain point, you know. Um, but yeah, that that emphasizes something I mentioned in the beginning that this is also very much the result of black feminist organizing. So if you have no access to archive to recognize knowledge spaces, community knowledge is always important, but we all know that community knowledge production is also very fraud. And InBest is very much built on the assumption that we can learn from queer feminist black understanding of community and knowledge production. So um, when we talk about intersectional black European studies, but what we also talk about is a certain kind of um, contradiction or ambivalence that we face, for example, through the fact that I am here, but almost um, all the people working on black Europe that, um, we invited to the workshop who work in the US are actually from Europe. Um, I came here about 20 years ago, but there are also people like Malika Stutznagel, who is a PhD student now, 
schools in Michigan because the European university system is still hostile to our forms of knowledge production. So one of the most frustrating things for me as, a, as an educator really is going back to Europe and meeting all these amazing young scholars who run into the same obstacles that I did almost 30 years ago. So the question of institutionalization is, is a difficult one. There are problems with it. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize what happens if you don't have that institutionalization. And that very often is that the knowledge production from the communities is not only erased, but also appropriated. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Denise, you said that Black studies have their moment now, but what is a very likely outcome in Europe is that that will lead, if it leads to position, it will lead to positions for white scholars who know nothing about Black studies. Um, so having that institutional power is important to push back against that. Having the institutional power and the money of an institution that is um, as problematic as Yale is, but that also is a space for places like the aforementioned European Studies Council, um, Rhythm, or the ERNM program. So you'll have collaborators in a situation that is not completely shaped by precarity. So um, what we can learn from this institutionalization here and what we might want to do differently is will also be um, an explicit topic on our afternoon panel. Um, so what I want to say about my kind of ambivalent position is um, focused on the digital archive, which is the part of, the, of our project that's located here, but also because it's not really a physical location. So this digital archive can be a space that is accessible from everywhere. It's also an archive that um, won't be owned by Yale, but by Invest. Um, and the idea behind it is in some ways, as Peggy mentioned, there are all these archives across, but often they are in basements or um, housed in community organizations that have very precarious funding, or they are put away in some institutions that couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. So one of the immediate goals of the digital archive is to, um, create a rock record of these materials before they might vanish. Um, another thought is to increase the pressure to actually have a kind of archiving of all these um, artifacts in their original location that reflects something that does not yet exist, namely an understanding of Black history as part of European history. But it might take a while until we get there. So for the moment, the digital archive might be a way of um, save certain materials that won't survive much longer. A very important part of that archive is also, and, and I believe the fellows will talk about more, uh, more about that on the panel, is that we create um, a manual. So what we did was archiving using smartphones and tablets. So the idea is to create an easily accessible manual with the archive that allows people everywhere to digitize and upload to our archive if they have nothing more than um, a smartphone. But um, we are also working with Yale, um, with um, Mike Princhy here on um, a kind of bibliography of online resources of Black Europe. So we have kind of the dual goal of creating a space for community and creating a space that helps prevent the appropriation of our knowledge by having it in a public space. And I think in that way, um, we here can com contribute hopefully in a way to a kind of Black European studies that is not then um, a kind of brain drain that um, locates most of the knowledge and most of the resources here. Um, yeah, I think um, that's um, what I'll say for now. 
we have room for um, Q&A after every session. So if any of you has any questions at this point, then you can ask now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Anita. I'm fascinated by the idea of uh, anyone with a smartphone being able to upload material to the archive, but I'm also something that I'm just like very nervous. That would make me very nervous. Uh, how do you, will there be some monitoring of the content that can be put in? So that makes sure that no malicious uploads can be made. Like, is there any gatekeeping that will have? Yeah, definitely. So I, I, I think we'll talk more about, about that later. Um, but that was really, really interesting in the process, like all the things we didn't think about beforehand that we have to put, um, that we have to consider now. So it's kind of a, uh, a constant move between very practical questions around coding and then these ethical questions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thankfully, it seems possible to create a digital archive that allows for this kind of gatekeeping. So that allows also for, because another advantage of a digital archive is that we don't own the materials, right? The, the rights remain with the owners and the owners can also decide how accessible they want to make their material. And then we can divide the space into publicly accessible um, parts of the archive. And then we haven't worked out that how we would do that, but one possibility would be that there would be certain parts of the archive that you can only um, access through the IP address of a community center, for example. So you would have to go there to get to all the materials. But yeah, this is all part part of the process. It's really fascinating. And um, Mike, if I understood correctly, there's, for, for example, also no Black Europe um keyword yet in the library of congress so this concept is not yet it is no it is we, we just talked about yeah yeah. yeah so that so there are there are many levels of this project right you can also we have to think about keywords in terms of accessibility also translation of course a huge huge topic when we talk about the african diaspora but it's also the possibility to define terms before they're defined by others mm -hmm. and one of the questions that we have is what is black europe and that's an open question. And as I mentioned earlier, there's space in the exhibit room for you all to leave comments. So if you have thoughts on what, what Black Europe means to you, please, please share that with us. We actually also have a, a microphone. Um, maybe I can um, add something to it, you know, the, this question, it's uh, what you said, it makes you nervous in, in terms of, you know, the accessibility of digitalizing, you know, um, what we also learned, you know, in, uh, I don't know how it is in the US, but at least for the German context, um, it is also, you know, who has the power of, um, uh, uh, and the, uh, the power of accessibility, so far, some of our materials are in um, uh, libraries and university libraries, and um, they have, of course, the technology easier accessible than um, uh, people from from the communities where these materials is in in their basement, and they actually um, get a headache over how to literally save it and not uh, being you know uh, destroyed. Um, and during, you know, while we were thinking about what can be an ethical code, uh, codex to um, how to do that, actually, uh, we learned, you know, that um, like the uh, Afriketa um, has been digitalized by some of the university uh, libraries. Um, and in Germany, it means they put their stamp literally on the physical uh, 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 copy, digitalizing it. Um, and that's what they own, you know. So, um, and this is something which is not, it's not just the question of how to um, digitalize with what technology and that everybody can do it, but how we reprocess um, our materials, you know.